survival in how could that happen he's not here all right we'll we'll start again okay i'm going to start again just psalm, psalm 108 verse 13 uh, it says, through God we shall do valiant, valiantly, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. And then 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, thanks be to God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Both scriptures will have a pertinence to our topic this evening, which is the East African revival. Not as well known as other revivals, and yet, especially here on, on this continent, and yet it spread rapidly through most of East Africa, and lasted for over 50 years, leaving a profound mark on the local churches, even to this very day. In fact, uh, the Anglican Church in East Africa was the first to break with the Anglican Church in the UK over the whole gay marriage thing, because they're still thoroughly evangelical and very conservative. And so, again, to this very hour, there's an impact on the East African Church. So there's some connections that we want to draw. There was a revival amongst British missionaries um, in 1894, Easter 1894, and there was a tremendous visitation of the Holy Spirit, and it infused in the Ugandan church a spirit of great missionary zeal. And then the Welsh revival of 1904 also affected Africa too, and particularly the emphasis on the need of conviction of sin and repentance amongst believers. Uh, being convicted of their sin, repenting of things that uh, needed to be repented of. So it had a big effect on the East African scene. But the revival I'm thinking of, really, scholars are uh, always trying to pinpoint a beginning of a revival. And most of the historians that have written about this particular revival would say that it really began in 1929. And it began when a British missionary called Joe Church. His full name is John Edward Church, but he was known as Joe Church. And also a quiet, unassuming Ugandan leader whose name, Simeone, and I'm going to have to really try hard to pronounce this, Nusibambi, Nusibambi. Okay, Simeone Nusibambi. Uh, this quiet, unassuming Ugandan brother. They both met together, and they, they were talking about the state of the church. And one of the things that really discouraged them was what they considered the laziness and the corruption of many churches. They made this comment, the only difference between pagans and Christians is the pagans sin openly, and the Christians hide it. Now, that's very challenging, isn't it? The only difference between pagans and Christians is the pagans sin openly, and the Christians hide it. And so, uh, Nisimbambi had heard Dr. Church speak about the power of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. And he wanted to hear more because he was disillusioned by what he saw in the church. And so these, these individuals, they, they met together and they began to talk together and pray together and read scripture together. Now, Joe Church, he was, he was very influenced by the higher life movement that was prominent in the UK. We often know it as the British Keswick movement, the Keswick Convention. And Church was very influenced by this. In fact, he believed uh, that the answer to the, the sloppiness in the church was preaching about the victorious Christian life and that Christians could enjoy victory in the power of the Holy Spirit over the deadening influence of the day. And so that was his message. That was his burden. Uh, that's what he believed, and that's what he preached. It, preached. And so um, these individuals, they got together, and um, they were concerned, how do we move forward? And, and really, this revival was a response to the decay and deadness in the churches. And one of the things they observed was it seemed that the churches were alienated from the power of God. And I think we could see very similar uh, parallels with our own day, uh, as you see at this time. Just want to tell you a little bit more about uh, Joe Church, because more is known about him uh, than Simeone. Uh, 
Uh, but um, he was a student at Cambridge. And the reason I want to go into his background is because it pulls together a lot of the church history strands we've considered in the past. Uh, he was converted in August 29th, 1920. And he became very involved in the Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union. And the group was very influential amongst Christian students, and particularly those interested in foreign missions. And it had become kind of the hallmark of Cambridge University as a result of Dwight L. Moody's famous revival meetings, which we've discussed in the past, and of course, the missionary commitment of the Cambridge Seven that we've talked about in the past. And so this is kind of the aftermath of Moody's campaign, the Cambridge Seven. There's still a strong uh, college campus uh, inter-varsity movement, a very great emphasis on missions. And a lot of young men uh, like uh, Joe Church, who was a medical student, uh, felt called of God to go on the mission field as a result of this environment, this atmosphere that was so prominent in the university at that time. Church, he, Church also um, said that the time there was very crucial to his spiritual and theological development as an individual. And one of the books that had a profound influence on him, and again, going back to the Keswick movement, was, was this book. It's, it's How to Live the Victorious Life by an Unknown Christian. Uh, the same individual also wrote a book called The Kneeling Christian, which is a wonderful book on prayer. So this particular book, uh, Church read it, and uh, of course, it represented the Keswick theology that was flourishing at that time. And, and the emphasis was that it was possible to enjoy victory and the fullness of the spirit and, and enjoy the higher Christian life, rather than just the carnality that was very prevalent in the day. And so in addition to this influence of the Keswick movement on his missionary work and his own personal life, uh, he actually set up a Keswick convention in Africa in 1938, uh, they held a Kenya in Kenya, Africa, the first Keswick convention on that continent. And again, he was a leader in that. And he became a very much a, an integral part of the work in East Africa was this, this Keswick theology that it's possible to live a life of victory. This is what Church said about his own experience. He says, and especially as he and Simeon came together, Simeone came together, he said, God in his sovereign grace met with me and brought me to the end of myself and thought fit to give me a share of the power of Pentecost. Oh, what a wonderful testimony, isn't it? To be brought to the end of yourself and God thinking fit to give me a share of the power of Pentecost. He said there was nothing very spectacular, nothing ecstatic. The only thing was a clearer vision of the risen Christ himself. Now, that's a wonderful testimony, isn't it? And so he was one who always uh, wanted to keep Christ at, uh, at the center of his life and ministry. He always wanted to have genuine fellowship uh, in oneness with his other co-workers in mission. And he wanted to live his life for God's highest in fact, he gave a speech at the Keswick Convention in England in, eight, in 1947, and in it, he laid out what his lifelong goals had been. And he said this, prayerfulness, brokenness, fullness, openness in the light, not open to anything, but open to be led by the Lord from the light of his word, openness, and then oneness in fellowship with God's people. And those were the things that motivated your church. So back to our story of the two men meeting, both Simeone and Joe had a fire that burned in their hearts for the Lord. Both of them were aware of the shortcomings in their own spiritual life and also in the church in Uganda. And uh, this, this burden, when they met, they sat together, read their Bibles, God met them. Both men were transformed as they came together, the two of them, and they began to pray for the, a move of the Holy Spirit that would result in deep conviction of sin amongst the African brethren and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
they were sure would follow. And as a result of their encounter, it resulted in the transformation of countless lives. The East African revival differed from its European and American counterparts in that it was not based on large scale preaching by famous personalities. Yes, there were some large open air meetings, uh, one in Kabali, Uganda in 1935. There's a lot of one on one evangelism that was done. But most of the work of the revival was done by ordinary African Christians who took the message to their extended families of the victory that they can enjoy in the Lord Jesus. And they would just spread this message out to people that whoever they, they were connected with, they often travel from place to place on foot by bicycles, motorcycles, cars, buses, trains. And by the early 1940s, so this is 29 now into the early 1940s, the revival had spread from Uganda to Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, parts of Congo, Sudan, and Tanganyika. Uh, there was a there was a, a hymn, and uh, unfortunately, I don't believe it's translated into English, or else I'd have Bob sing it. It's a it's a Luganda hymn, and it's called "We Praise You, Jesus." Uh, I won't even try and pronounce the title in Luganda, uh, but just like the Welsh revival had that great hymn "Love as Vast as the Ocean," that kind of was just. Uh, sung all over. Well, this We Praise You, Jesus, just echoed across East Africa as believers met together and they sang We Praise You, Jesus. And there was a great emphasis in the revival on what Christ has done for sinners. And so this hymn became kind of encapsulated that message of what Christ had done for sinners. The East African evangelists, they had a, a name uh, Balo, Baloloke was the name, and it simply meant saved ones <laughs> in Lugandan. And they, one of the emphases was as they went preaching the gospel, they encouraged people to get involved in a local church. And there was a tremendous adding to the churches by this revival. As they went around preaching, people were added to churches. Uh, tremendous numbers came to Christ. Uh, a great work was done. And so the churches in East Africa continued to grow with the thousands of true believers in Jesus, and it continued to expand through the work of African missionaries throughout the world. Here's some of the things that were said about the effects of the revival. It says, revival, at least it was experienced and understood in East Africa, brought about a great acceptance of the message of the gospel. And some of us have preached in, I've preached in Kenya, and I would say there's never a place where I preached where I felt the ground was more fertile and people were more receptive to the message. And again, part of that is the after effects of that revival. There's, there's still, even in the general culture, a love for the gospel. And, and so as a result of that revival, it, it led to this, uh, this great acceptance of the message of the gospel. It strengthened churches. It, in large uh, populations, large churches, and um, through it, uh, there was uh, such a testimony. Uh, this is this is a, a testimony of of the impact of it. Worldly business people would employ saved East Africans in their homes and businesses because they could completely trust them and rely on them to work hard. So it even affected the workplace. Now, like you want to employ somebody, employ a converted East African. He'll do, he'll do the, the job that you hire him to do. And so it was characterized. These are the characteristics of the revival. One historian says this, it was characterized by a deep remorse for sin, a desire for holiness, and a close relationship with God. And also, the practical outworking was a treating other people with sincere love and honesty. That sounds like a pretty good revival to me, doesn't it? Wouldn't you love it if those things were true in our day? We said some of the hallmarks of this revival included repentance and confession, restitution, uh, putting things right, strong emphasis on a life that is lived walking in the light. 
First John 1, 6 and 7, walking in the light as he is in the light. And so there was that tremendous emphasis of walking in the light. The rival Christians walked in the light with each other. They shared spiritual victories and blessings. They confessed failures and weaknesses. They shared plans and aspirations. They sought counsel and support. There was such a unity, a oneness. And, and it, it overcame a lot of tribal barriers and even racial barriers. The missionaries, they just called each other brethren, brothers. And there was this sense of love and camaraderie. There was a humility and a brokenness. They were frightened to, be, to ever become stiff-necked as Stephen described the Pharisees in Acts 7.51, there was a fear amongst the Christians that they would ever become stiff-necked. Uh, when they had new converts, they would pray with them for the power of the Holy Spirit to give them victory over sin and an ongoing passion to know Jesus more and more. And so many, many lives were touched. And one of the great things about it was this, that it was so Christ-centered. It, it, they talked about the real experience of the revival was an awareness of the saving power of Christ, a deep submission to him. There was no emphasis on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, such as speaking in tongues or supernatural healing. It was the most Christ-centered revival. He was the center of everything. And so the message of sin, repentance, forgiveness by the blood of Christ was the overriding message preached by church and his fellow African evangelist. They said this, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus and points us to the blood of Jesus for cleansing when we may have grieved him along the way. And so that was their message. And it was a very long lasting and it said even to this day, the effects of the East African revival are felt, even though it had its beginnings in 1926. And here's just a, a final shot uh, before we close. I've said a long, for a long time, I'm convinced that God sends revival prior to some catastrophe that is coming on the world. So, for instance, the 1904 revival came before the 1914-18 war. Uh, the 1857 revival in the U.S. came before the Civil War that took place 63 onwards. And so it seems like the Lord recognized there's going to be carnage and there's a great ingathering beforehand. And what's interesting is East Africa, the scene of these great revivals, would also be the scene of Idi Amin in Uganda and his brutal dictatorship. But also Rwanda would be the scene of the Rwandan genocide in which many were slaughtered. And yet prior to that, God brought in a marvelous harvest of souls. So it should make us optimistic because it would seem to us that in our culture, we're heading for persecution. And maybe the Lord might bless us with revival before that comes and there'll be a big ingathering of souls before that time arrives. May God encourage us with these thoughts.